Hello, Professor Hanke. How is the weather? Where are you in Baltimore? Uh, Martin, good to be with you. The weather is nice, sunny, and cold. <laughs> <laughs> How about Sofia? Uh, Sofia um, is a very dark place in the in the end of the the winter. Uh, let's start with the questions. The first question is. Um, from our audience uh, for the crypto issues. What do you think about cryptocurrencies and uh, especially Bitcoin? Well, let me, let me say that I am a cryptocurrency skeptic uh, in, in general. And in, in, in particular, if we look at Bitcoin, I think it's a highly speculative asset with zero fundamental value. So it, it, if it, uh, any, anyone should be free to be speculating in Bitcoin, but it's a little bit like going to a casino, hmm. highly, highly risky. And there have been studies that have been uh, conducted uh, by Morningstar in particular. And those studies show that if you have one to two percent of your wealth in Bitcoin, it, it really contaminates your, your whole portfolio and wealth. It, it injects a huge amount of risk in, into your portfolio. So again, Bit, Bitcoin is just gambling. It, it's not something with any fundamental value and, and very little use, by the way. Bit, Bitcoin is, is not used for transactions it's it's very diff it's difficult to use and and it's not used very often except in of course illegal transactions its main use is for cr criminals use it and terrorists so I, 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 I that's that's one that's one comment the other thing I would say is that I have some of my best former students, are highly involved in, in uh, cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin in particular on Wall Street. So, so I, I have some former students who are very big in it. And I have one of my former students, we're writing a book right now on, on money and banking and, and we are highly critical. Our, our book will come out actually in January of 2025 and, and will be fairly critical, skeptical. Okay, some somebody will be very surprised in Bulgaria because here we have a, a campaign for freedom of Bitcoin. Well, I, I, I don't, again, let, let me be clear about this. I, I think anyone who wants to speculate in Bitcoin should be free to do so. It, 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 it shouldn't be illegal. All I'm saying is that you better beware. It's like going to a casino. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, might, you might lose everything. Yeah. Okay, the second question was... Um, are the digital currencies uh, the salvation from the huge national debts, maybe in the USA or Europe? No, no. Is the, an the short answer is, is no. The, the solution for national debts is to constrain government spending. Put a, put a cap on government spending. And the best way to do that is with uh, what the Swiss did. The, the Swiss had a referendum, a national referendum. Okay, di digital currencies will not solve the national debt problem. The only way to solve the national debt problem is for the government to slow down spending and, and balance their budgets. It, it's like a, a, a person. If you're, if you're spending more than you're earning, your debt goes up, 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 and pretty soon you're bankrupt. And that's what happens with these national governments. The only way to solve the problem, Martin, is to do what they did in Switzerland, that they put a Swiss debt break in the Constitution in Switzerland. And that debt break says that the budget must be balanced and 
government spending in Switzerland can't increase at a rate more rapid than the rate of growth in the economy. So, so that, that means that the government can't squeeze out the rest of the economy. Mm -hmm. But uh, they prepare a uh, CBDC. What is this CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency? Maybe this is the trick. Well, uh, 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 digital currency would be as follows. In the United States, for example, about 11% of the money supply is US dollar notes and coins. And, and if that was digitized 100%, that 11% portion of the money supply would, would, would not be in paper money or, mm -hmm. or, or metal coins. It would, be, it would be like a credit card. Yeah. You, you, it would be all digitized. I, I'm very opposed to this, and I'll tell you why. Because if the central bank would digitize the money, they would be able to monitor everything you were doing. So, would would you would you like them at the Bulgarian National Bank to be monitoring every purchase that Martin made and no. know, knowing how you're spending your money? And by the way, the danger is. What if, what if they didn't like what Martin was buying? They could cut him off. They they could they could they could it, it would be like canceling a credit card. You you would have no way to spend. They they they, they really could could in a way put you in a in a prison. <laughs> yeah. Everything will be in the spotlight. Absolutely, every I would I would say it wouldn't be in the spotlight. It would be under the microscope mm -hmm. uh, of the authorities. They they would know every time you bought a candy bar, every time you bought a, a something big like a car, a washing machine. They they'd know everything. Yeah, you know the referendum for the euro in Bulgaria has failed. How else can we stop the forced push into the eurozone? I, I think the uh, w one way and the and the best way is that all the politicians in Bulgaria who who are for going into the euro if if you don't like if you don't like the idea of going to the euro you you're forced to vote against those politicians so you throw them out of office now the the, the politicians have have censored the Bulgarians they, the court. The Supreme Court said yeah. that they couldn't have a referendum. This this is a bad decision because clearly all the requirements for a referendum, I think, were met in Bulgaria. The court said no, and I think that I think it was a political decision yeah. that has very little to do with law, and and therefore, the only option the Bulgarians have, they've been censored. They've been told they couldn't vote. Yeah. So when they do vote the next time in a regular election, they throw out all, all the incumbents, throw them out. Okay. Yeah, if, if, if look, if, if, let's, let's say you have a, a basket of apples and, and you've got a bad, bad apple in the basket. Every, everyone knows you take the bad apple out. You get rid of it because if you don't, it's going to contaminate all the other apples and they'll all be bad. So the bad politicians who have restricted the rights of Bulgarians to vote, get those bad apples out. But these bad apples are European bad apples. There are there, there a, there, there a lot of bad apples in, in, in the basket. So you, you have to pay attention and make certain you get rid of all of them. And uh, uh, what is your forecast for the Eurozone? Do you think that uh, a collapse is imminent? I don't, I don't think the collapse is imminent, but, but the Eurozone, my forecast is a very pessimistic one. The, the Euro, Eurozone in Europe has been growing at a much slower rate than the United States for about 20 years. It, and 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 it, it's it's slowly going down the slope with more and more EU 
and European Commission intervention. And I think also the sanctions on Russia have been uh, unbelievably damaging to Europe. They've, they've almost destroyed Germany's industrial uh, base and, and damaged a lot of the European economy. So in general, in, in the long term, in the long term, negative. In the short term, also pretty negative because the long term, you have a, a long trend down, 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 down. That's where Europe's going. It's going down. In the short term, of course, there are ups and downs, ups and downs, ups and downs, and and now you're in a down. You're you're entering you're entering a, a, a period of time when I think you will be in a down cycle, led led by, of course, Germany, who's in a recession. The United Kingdom, which isn't part of the EU, the United Kingdom is in a, in a recession. And by the way, an, another country that's in recession, Japan just went in recession this week. I think the United States, due to bad monetary policy and the contraction in the money supply in the United States, I, I think by the end of this year, the U.S. will be in a recession. So. So everyone is going down, and, and and including, by the way, of course, we can't forget China. China down. Things are getting getting weak in China. Do you see? Do you foresee a second Great Recession coming in the near future? Uh, I, I I don't know whether I would call it great, but it, I think I think it will be real in in the in the United States. The money supply has contracted by 4.5% since March of 2022. It's, it's only contracted four times since 1913, only four times. And each time it's contracted, we've had a recession following it. So I think it will occur this time because we have to go all the way back to 1929, 1933, before we find the kind of contraction that we've experienced recently in the United States. And, and what happened then? We had a Great Depression, not a Great Recession. Uh -huh. Yes, that's, that's what we had then. The money supply contracted much more in 1929 than it, than it has in 2022, 2023. But it's, it's still contracted 2022, 2023, and there has never been a case of a contraction in the money supply that has not been followed by a recession. Because remember, money is a fuel for the economy. It, it, if you run out of fuel in your car, what happens? The car stops. Uh, a little bit uh, geopolitical uh, questions from our audience. What conclusions can be drawn from Carlson's interview with President Putin? Well, no, number one, I think uh, Carlson didn't ask very penetrating questions. I thought the questions were weak. Yeah. And and he, he, as they say, he he was throwing Putin soft, as they say, softballs, and and Putin, I thought, was bad. Because Putin didn't was poorly advised. He did. He doesn't understand the Western audience. He he was giving a long lecture like you would give in Eastern Europe or some or Russia or someplace. In the West, you, you got to get to the point. Deliver your message. Keep it short. He he went on for on and on and on. History. He was way out in the weeds on things that pe people. People went to sleep by the time they got to the end of the thing. So I thought Carlson did a bad job. I thought Putin did a bad job. What about the interview? I think I think it was great that they had the interview because it's always good, especially in diplomacy, especially in tense times, that you hear what the other side has to say. And this was the first Western interview that Putin had. So I wanted to hear what Putin had to say. I, I was not very impressed with Putin. But 
but but I li I listen very carefully to it, and 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 I do I, I did draw some conclusions, and and the and the main conclusion is that I I think from Putin's point of view the the war is essentially over and and he wants to negotiate a peace. Yeah. Yeah. This that, is that's my that's my simple conclusion out, out of the thing. He 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 is ready to talk to the other side and negotiate a peace and and the problem is very clear the other side doesn't want to talk to him why well i think it's utter stupidity <laughs> in in diplomacy you talk to the other side and and, and you try to work out a deal so I, I war is the enemy so what do, what do you do with the enemy? I want to stop the enemy. The enemy is war. I want to stop the war as fast as I can. Stop destroying, killing people. Stop destroying Ukraine. Come, come to a negotiated settlement of some kind and, and end it. Now, now one, by the way, one way to end it very quickly is for the U.S. to stop financing it and stop sending munitions. If the U.S. stopped funding, the thing would end in a hurry, because that's that's where the the big fuel for the fire comes mainly from the United States. Is there a sense of a possible deal between Moscow and Washington? This part right of, now, yeah. right now, no, no, no deal. That, that's my that's my my view is 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 no. But if you if you listen to the the speeches in Munich at the security meeting this past week, it's pretty clear that the Western leaders are pretty pessimistic and, and, and they're coming to the reality of what I told you the last time we had an interview. I said, Russia will not lose. R Russia was, is not going to lose. And, and I think at the Munich conference, it was very clear that the leaders in the West are, are realizing the reality of the fact that Russia is not going to lose and they are going to have to figure out some way to come to a peace agreement. But, but they're not quite there yet. Mm -hmm. I think Putin offered the peace. The, the, only, the only one that I'm aware of that's offered to talk about it is, is Putin. But yeah. That, that, that's what he said in the Tucker Carlson interview, and 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 he also said, as I recall, that that he doesn't have anybody to talk to. No, no one wants to talk to him. Mm -hmm. So so this is this is not the way you proceed in in the real world. You you proceed with diplomacy and diplom. What is diplomacy? Diplomacy is just two sides talking to each other. Figuring out what their positions are and, and trying to come to some agreement. It, it's a, it's it's a little it's a little bit like the Bulgarian referendum on the on the euro. <laughs> you see, what 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 the what the court said in Bulgaria is is what the West is telling Putin. They say we we don't want you to talk. They're yeah. telling the Bulgarian public, no, we we don't want you to tell us what you think about the lev and the euro. They're, they're saying that's illegal. We don't want it. Shut up. Could you explain what's going on in Texas? Well, I, in, in Texas, uh, which of course is a, a large, one of the largest states in the United States, a very important state, uh, it borders Mexico, and that border is is essentially open. I mean, if you want to come into the United States, you you essentially can walk in, and, and that that is amazing. Can you imagine in Bulgaria? No, if I... the border with Turkey. What what if the border with Turkey or Greece? You could just walk in, and anyone, anyone from Syria, Afghanistan. That that's what's going on. Now, there there's some legal trappings. They say that. People coming in, a, 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 a lot, a lot of them just come in uh, illegally and, and disappear. Uh, a, a lot of them also come in under asylum. They they say there's 
asylum seekers. They want to re obtain asylum in the United States. And, and what they do, they, they get logged in, they sign their name, they give the name, and, and then the court says, well, you come back and, and we'll, we'll hear your case in five or six years. Well, you know, they're, they're never going to show up for court. <laughs> they, just dis, they just disappear into the United States. So a huge amount of illegal immigration coming in, it's being fueled and facilitated by the drug cartels in Mexico. That's how they come in. Now, if you watch the pictures, it's very interesting of the people coming in. They all have clean clothes, new shoes, new portable telephones. Now, now where, do, where do they get those? And, and where do they get the money to pay five or 6,000 US dollars to the drug cartels to let them in? Mm -hmm. that's, that's what I'd like to know. But so in, in short, it's chaos at the border in Texas. He said, what's going on at the border? It's chaos. To close the border. It, 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 as you know very well in Bulgaria, you, you can close the border very easily. And, and by the way, it, it was being controlled and not chaotic uh, during the Trump years. Biden came in and... And it went zooming up. Yeah. So, so no, no laws have been changed. It's just the enforcement of the laws that we actually have. They're, they're being ignored by the Biden administration. So this will be a big issue, by the way, in the election, the next election. The, the board, what's going on in Texas will be a big, big issue. Professor Hanke, if you want, don't answer, but uh, are you... Trump supporter, Trump supporter. I'm not a fan of, of any of the of any any of the above. Mm -hmm. However, to put it into perspective, we, we we it's it's the bad apple. It's the bad apple in the basket problem. And and clearly Biden is a bad apple. He's been very bad for the economy. He's been a, a disaster. He's 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 financing two wars at the at present time. One in Ukraine and, and, and one in Gaza, Israel, Gaza. And, and as somebody who thinks war is the enemy, that's bad. So the, he's been bad on the economy. He's been bad on U.S. sovereignty. We just talked about with the border. He, he's been a, a disaster with international relations. And anyone who starts and, and is a party to a war is, is a bad president. So, so I would I would put Biden in the the bad apple category. So you, you get the bad apple out of the basket. I, I'm not I'm not saying anything about Trump. I'm just worried about the bad apples right now. We we have to take one step at a time. And and the current incumbent is is the one I will be voting against. I, I don't know who the alternative is going to be, but the the bad you, you get rid of the bad guy. It's the same in Bulgaria with this currency thing we were talking about. You said, well, what do you do if if they don't allow a referendum in Bulgaria? What do, what do the Bulgarians do? Because most of the Bulgarians, given the surveys, want to keep the left. They they don't want to go to the euro. Mm -hmm. So what you do if you're a Bulgarian, you find out. What Bulgarian politicians are for getting rid of the Lev and going into the Euro, and you vote against them. Yeah. You, you just vote, vote, whoever the alternative is, you vote for them. Get, get rid of the bad apples. Okay. And, and by the way, in, in Bulgaria, the, the one thing that's interesting, if, if you, it, it's very interesting, actually, if you look at polling of the politicians in Bulgaria, the favorable ratings of politicians, the major politicians have it, it's pretty low. But the negatives, the negatives are huge. You, you almost find no country in the world where the negatives are that high. In, in short, the, the Bulgarians dislike and distrust their politicians tremendously, much more so than almost any other country I've looked at data on. 
I, I mean, you look, for example, at the Minister of Finance, Vasilio, he, he has a negative rating of like 65%. Uh, almost no positive ra ra ratings for Vasilio, but the negatives are massive. And, and the prime minister almost as bad. Yeah. Let's speak a little bit for everyday life in Bulgaria. What is your advice for the ordinary Bulgarian family? This is a very broad question. Uh, the, 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 main, the, the main thing is to make certain that the children are, are well educated. You, 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 you've got to get a good education. This is step one. If you don't have a good education, you're going to have a problem in your entire life. So as a family, you want to make certain the children get, get a, a go to school, work hard, get a good education. So that's, that's step one. For people who are a little bit older, uh, it, it's very important to improve, shall we say, their financial literacy. So, so they learn how to take care of their finances. They don't, they don't get into financial trouble. And if you look at Bulgaria, I've looked at the uh, uh, OECD studies for financial literacy, and Bulgaria families are, are about the same as they are in all, in all the Balkans and Eastern Europe. But they're, they're quite a bit, those, those Balkan countries are much lower in financial literacy planning their budget, being aware of, of how to save, how to invest, and that kind of thing. It's much lower than someplace like Germany, for example. So there's room for improvement there. The, the, the big problem in, in, in Bulgaria, and this is kind of an institutional problem, is that the Bulgarians, I, I've already said, they don't trust the politicians. We know, we know that. But also, when it comes to finances and financial literacy, the, the, the only thing they, they trust is the currency board, the Bulgarian National Bank. To, get, to obtain information, about 35% of the population in Bulgaria say they, they trust the information coming from the Bulgarian National Bank. If, if you go then and ask them, do you trust the information coming from the Ministry of Finance, only about 7%, it drops way down. And then if you say, do you trust the information you get from private banks? It even drops lower, it drops down to about 5%. So, so there's a big, huge trust problem in Bulgaria. The Bulgarian population doesn't, they don't trust the leadership and the, the elites. This, this, this is a, a, a super big problem. So uh, how do you solve that problem? You, 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 you simply have to unfortunately spend more time sifting through information data to make your decisions and, and plan your family budget. So step one, make certain the children are going to school getting a good education. Step two, make certain you have a budget and, and, and that budget is one in which your spending is not exceeding your income. Your spending should be less than your income. You should be saving a little bit. Like a squirrel, squirreling, squirreling something away for a rainy day. Like a squirrel for a rainy day. <laughs> that, that's about all the general advice that I could give. You, you say savings, but in leva, in euro, in, in what, in bitcoins, in gold? A few years ago, I was asked by one of the directors at the, at the opera in Sofia what, what to do, lev or dollars. And I said, it's, it's hard to tell. I said, keep 50% in dollars and 50% in lev. And by the way, that that's been that's been pretty good advice. <laughs> it's conservative, but you're hedged a little bit. If the if the lev goes a little bad, you, you you can rely on that dollar. If the dollar goes a little bad, so far it's it's worked well because since I gave that advice about four or five years ago, actually the dollar's gotten very strong. 
so so that savings in dollars has been has been good but don't 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 take excessive risk what do you think uh, how will bulgaria have enough money to pay its pensions with this demographic situation this is a big problem uh and and it's a big problem because uh The social security system it, it is is set up. It's it's not a private system. It, it's not with private accounts. It's with the public, and and it depends on younger people who are working paying for older people who are retired. It's the same in the United States. So you, you've got a demographic crunch in the in the sense that you've got. <laughs> You've got more and more people, older people retiring, living off fewer and fewer younger people. So, so this creates a problem because to finance that, you, you have to tax the younger people more and more. And when you do that, that discourages work and, and, and even discourages young people from staying in Bulgaria. Why, why do you think people want to go to London or New York or Paris or wherever they're going. So, so it, it is a it is a big problem. The the only way for Bulgaria really to solve this problem is to liberalize the economy as much as they can. Remember my Singapore strategy: small government, few regulations, less red tape. What? Let, let, let the economy liberalize and open up and, and grow at a faster rate. And, and, and I think if that happened, you would have a, 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 a big improvement in investment from outsiders in high tech in Bulgaria. I think high, high tech is, a, is a, a great place to go. Uh, and and a Bulgaria could be very attractive in high tech. And by the way, that would solve many of the demographic problems because I was I was reading this last week. Even in Japan, they they have retail stores now that are run. They have a demographic problem like Bulgaria, yeah. Japan does. They they have exactly the same problem, and and they're solving it with high tech because they they have many even small stores that are completely run by robots. There, there are no people running the store. They're robots. So, so the, this idea that you need a lot of people is is a little bit of a fantasy. You, you don't. There are ways to attack the problem, and I think I think that generally, the best way to do it is to liberalize the economy and and go with the, with the Singapore strategy. You will not do that. Going with the EU strategy. The EU strategy is going to bury Bulgaria. It, it's going. It's going down. E, e, EU is nothing but a red tape machine. What do they? What do they do in Brussels? All they do is produce new regulations. They promise us a free market, but we didn't. Ha we don't have a free market. You understand? Well, I, 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 that I think that is is your salvation. And if you look at history, there is no country that hasn't moved more towards the free market that hasn't benefited tremendously by increasing the rate of growth and prosperity. So, so for Bulgaria to converge with the rest of Europe, for example, the, the only way to do that is, is to have Bulgaria more open, more liberal, freer, and and than the rest of Europe. You, you, you can't be, if you're regulated like the rest of Europe, you'll, you'll never converge on Europe. You'll be at the back of the bus. That's the problem. Bulgaria is at the back of the bus now in the EU, and, and, and if they don't attempt to change the structure of regulations that they're facing, they'll, they'll remain at the back. If you're Daniel Kanchev, ask you the currency board happened because there was a hyperinflation today there is a need for a political board 
This will have to be a mechanism to limit the corrupt political, political class in decision making. How to do this? Okay, good. so Ken Jeff has a good question here. This, this, is, this is actually the key to the whole thing. And, and I, I think that you should move more towards direct democracy with more, more like Switzerland. So the second step is to require supermajority voting to pass any law, any spending law, for example. Any spending law would have to require two-thirds majority voting yes. And so if, if Kanchev is right, he's asking the right question. And, and, and you, you have to constrain the politicians and, and, and take power away from them and, and give it back to the people. The only way you can change things is to have some kind of revolt. And the only way to have a revolt is, is to go to the voting booth and, and vote out the bad apples. You say this... Uh uh, example for bad apples, but who show us the bad apples? The medias show us the bad apples, and medias are bad apple too. This is yet another problem in Bulgaria that the the media is controlled by the bad apples. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so this is this this gets back to what we were talking about. If you look at Bulgaria and the polls that are done. The level of trust of Bulgarians in in anything to do with the government or politicians or or many institutions, even private banks, the Bulgarians they just don't trust them. It's the elites, you see. The the problem in Bulgaria, the the elites are not trusted. I mean, there there. By the way, there's a very good reason why people don't trust politicians. You, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Lydia Stefano asks, uh, what is Professor Hanke's opinion about free immigration? If you, if you call what's happening in Texas at the border free immigration, I'm against it. I think sovereignty and border control is the equivalent in the public sector is equivalent of private property in the private sector. So, so, so you have to think of it that way. It's like <laughs> your house is private property. It should be protected. For a country, the borders are sovereign and they should be protected. So yes, you, you should have the freedom to properly apply for a visa, for example, to move in and out of a country. Or you should have the right to apply for citizenship in a country. There's, there should be a legal procedure to do this. Now, yeah. now they say, for example, in the United States and in, in all of Europe, they say, oh, we have a procedure for asylum. So if you come from Afghanistan, oh, yeah, you can sign up. Or, or you, you come from Chechnya you, and you go to France, you, you can sign up for asylum. But, but then they don't require you to actually show up in court and, and have your case heard. You just disappear. And the, the system is rigged. For example, the, these murders that have occurred recently, you know, with the head, chopping the heads off with Chechens in Paris, teachers in school, this was in school, chopping the heads off. Th those people, were known to the authorities, they were on the list of terrorists, and, and the laws are so, such a mess in France that, that they couldn't deport them. They, they, couldn't, they, they couldn't send them back to Chechnya. So, so the, West, the West has a huge problem of this. This, in every country, not just the United States, this is a, a massive, massive problem. Let's speak a little bit about myths in Bulgaria. First myth that uh, we have a lot of gold. Second myth, uh, where is our gold reserve? Well, <laughs> I, I remember uh, once, uh, this goes way back in 1993, Sir, Sir Alan Walters and I 
went went to the governor of the central bank at the at the time was professor Velchev, and 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 we and we wanted to and what we the reason we went there for we went there for two reasons we wanted to talk to Velchev about putting in a currency board this this was in i it's either 92 or 93 i i can't remember exactly the year yeah. so so we saw professor Velchev and and we talked to him about the currency board and 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 he he tried to convince us that everything was under control <laughs> And we said, no, it's not under control. It's going to collapse. You, you better put in a currency board now before it collapses. That, so that was one topic. The second topic was that Walters and I were trying to uh, convince the Bulgarian National Bank to, to loan their gold out. They, they had gold, and, and we wanted them to loan the gold on the London gold market so that the Bulgarian National Bank would earn an interest by loaning the gold out. Yeah. And, and in, the, in the process of discussing this with Professor Velchev, we, we said, well, we, we'd like to actually see the gold. We want, to, we want to inspect the gold to see if it's there. So we did. And, and it was there. Where? In, in Sofia? Yeah, in the vault, in the, in the Bulgarian in the vault National in, Bank. Yeah, I know where is this vault. So, so at, at, at that time, we, we wanted to, as they say, we wanted to kick the tires and, and actually, because and why did we want to do that? Because it, this thing of trust, I'm talking about a lot about trust today. We, we didn't trust the Bulgarian National Bank. So we, we wanted to actually kick the tires, see the gold, which, which, which we did. And, and so in, in 1992 or 1993, I, I know where the gold was because I saw it. And but now? Where, where, it is, where it is now, I don't know because I haven't kicked the tires lately. <laughs> well, I think this, th these questions, this is an easy question to answer because oh, to, to, because all you have to do is go to go to the, the Bulgarian National Bank and, and and request a a a tour of the of the vault and an inspection of the vault and and if there's a big public issue I, if I was the governor of the Bulgarian National Bank I, I I would myself go down open the vault uh, have, have a video camera uh, and sh show, show the book. If there's a, if this is an issue, it's very easy to solve. But, and by the way, that that just gives the Bulgarian National Bank more credibility. Let's see the next question. Tihomir Atanasov asks: Do you know who and why ordered the attack on the Bulgarian left and the Bulgarian banks in the winter of 1996? No. No. But it was attack. Well, I, I you, you have to define attack for first of all. So 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 it it's undefined so I can't answer the question. But but what was happening in 1996? Think about this. It wasn't that there there was some outside huge speculator speculating against the lev. It, it, it was every Bulgarian, the inflation, remember, in Feb, by the time it, it, the inflation peaked in February of 1997, yeah. the monthly inflation rate was 242% per month. So what, what, did, what did your parents, what did they do? They got rid of the left as fast as they, they could. Were they attacking the left? No. They were just trying to save their money. I wouldn't. I wouldn't describe what was going on in 1996 as an attack. I mean, it, it wasn't like George Soros attacking the British pound. It wasn't that kind of thing. The Alev was like a hot potato. He wanted to get rid of it as fast as he possibly could because it was losing its value so fast. So, so that that wasn't an attack. It was just, I would say, a rational, smart thing to be doing. Thank you for this uh, answer. We have a very good friend, Professor Ivo Christov. Professor Ivo Christov uh, asked, why Professor Hanke don't warn us in 90s 
what will happen. I'm not in the business of making, shall we say, long-term futuristic yeah. projection. His opinion, it's too late to warn us now for Euro, for Schengen, for immigration. If it's very specific things, I, I have a pretty good idea. And for example, the Lev versus the Euro, I, I, have a, I have a very good idea of what the benefits and cost. Of, but let's take another thing that I know a lot about, actually, because in the 1970s, I worked on this when I was a researcher at the Institute for Advanced Systems Analysis in Vienna. And I, I was working on Bulgaria's water problems. And, and that was in the late 1970s. Well, you, you still have the water problems. They're not fixed. It's a disaster. I, I followed what's been going on the last four or five years with water in, the, in, in Bulgaria simply because I, I was involved in analyzing that many, many years ago in the 1970s. This, this was in the old communist era. I was, I was looking at this. Yeah. And it was a problem. It was a big problem in Bulgaria then, and it remains a big problem now. So why, why are politicians worried about the lev and the euro, and, and they're not worried about fixing the water systems? Some of the villages and towns, it's just a complete disaster in Bulgaria, the water. Yeah. Nobody speak for this. Nobody. No media. No politics. No, no, no. I know what they do. I know what they do. They they go they go with the begging bowl to the EU to get money to fix the system, and, and the money comes to Bulgaria and and it disappears. But the system isn't fixed. That that's what happens. Last question. I heard you suggest a new calendar. Calendar. Please tell us about uh, about it. What is this new? calendar okay the calendar is it's called the hanky henry permanent calendar because i i developed this with a professor of astrophysics at the johns hopkins university uh dick henry richard uh, henry and and the calendar is permanent in the sense that every day is on the same day every year forever so you only have one calendar you, you never change the calendar one one calendar is permanent forever now what does a calendar look like the calendar has four quarters in it three months obviously in each quarter the first two months of of the quarter have 30 days in it the third quarter has 31 days in it. So we end up with 364 days in the year. But 364 days is less than 365 and a quarter days, which is the, the time it takes the Earth to revolve around the sun, 365 and one-fourth day. Yeah. So to adjust for that, what do we do now with a regular calendar? We have leap day every four years. A day is added. So this year is, is leap year. And, and this month, by the way, we will have 29 days, yeah. not 28, yeah. this year. Yeah. And, that, and then four years from now, we will have, again, 29 days instead of 28. Yeah. That's leap year. I know. The Hanky Henry permanent calendar would have leap week but that would happen every six years. And we would add an extra week at the end of December. So, so why is this adding going on? Leap day, leap week, leap month, and these calendars. It's to keep the calendar from drifting. It's called calendrical drift. And, and, if, and, if, and if you didn't add the extra day, since the calendars or even the Gregorian calendar you see has 365 days. Well, that's, that's less than 365 and a quarter days. So each year you're losing about six hours. So every four years we add a day yeah. to, to adjust for that. Yeah. Now you say, well, why do you want to do that? Why do you want to adjust? And why do you want to stop the drift? 
if you didn't stop the drift, January after a hundred after a hundred years, for example, on a Gregorian calendar, January would really be into the season of Fe of what's now February. It would drift into February, and eventually, after uh, three or four hundred years, you would have January coming when spring, uh, springtime, when it's light and, and yeah. warm and sunny. Yeah. So that's that's the reason for that. Now, why is this calendar, this permanent calendar, Hanky Henry permanent calendar, important? It's important because it it's it's it it makes for a lot of economic benefits because you can schedule everything once, like school days, for example. What happens now in Bulgaria in school days? Well, the schools have to get together each year to decide what the school schedule is going to be. Or, or scheduling sporting events. You have to, every year there has to be a committee or somebody has to decide, wasting time. If you had a permanent calendar, it, it's always the same. Martin, what's your birthday? What, what day of the year? 4th of February. 4th, okay. The 4th of February on the Hanky Henry permanent calendar would always be on Saturday, forever. Our, our Independence Day in the United States is July 4. That, that would be on a Thursday, forever. So all these things would become regularized and, and this, they've done calculations in the United Kingdom. The, the benefits are fairly significant. It's, it's about 1% of gross national product would be added by con having these official holidays on long weekends, for example, not disrupting the week. Yeah. Not having, not having confusing schedules and so forth. There are a few people in, in Bulgaria who actually know about this calendar. Um, one was the, your foreign minister, Solomon, you know. He's, he, he has a, uh, expertise in permanent calendars because there, there are many different kinds of permanent calendars. It happens our calendar, the Hanky Henry, is, is superior because we don't alter the Sabbath. Every seven days, we keep seven days, always seven days. Every, every week has seven days, and we don't alter the Sabbath. That, that is very important because there, there was a permanent calendar, a world calendar, it was permanent. It was being proposed and almost was adopted by the League of Nations in 1939. It eventually was not adopted because the U.S. vetoed it, and the U.S. vetoed it because they added a day periodically and, and the addition of that day, it messed up the Sabbath. By, by, by adding a day, you, you had an eight-day week. Mm -hmm. And so the U.S. said no, and, 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 they, uh, and that was purely because of religious reasons. But our, we, we preserve the Sabbath with a Hanky Henry permanent calendar. I promise to you, we will explain this calendar in Bulgaria. My great wish would be that Bulgaria would be the first country to adopt the Hanky Henry permanent calendar. They adopted the currency board, why not a permanent calendar? I mean... I like the currency board, but I don't understand very well this calendar, but uh, I, w I will read a little bit uh, more for this calendar, and I promise to you, we'll advertise in Bulgaria. The beauty of it is its simplicity and its permanence. Yeah. Uh, here's what we're going to do. We, we, if we would, if Bulgaria would adopt this, we would change the name from the Hanky Henry permanent calendar to the Bulgarian permanent calendar. Uh, this is very interesting. It, it might work. Yeah. Thank you for this conversation. We will explain the Bulgarian calendar after okay, this great conversation. Okay, great to be with you, Martin. Thank you very much. One more time, Professor Hanke. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.